Hello, everyone. I'm Josipa Petrnich. I'm the president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium. And I welcome you here today from my virtual conference platform in Toronto to the second annual Low Carbon Smart Mobility Technology Innovation Conference. Before we begin, though, I wish to express thanks and gratefulness to all Indigenous communities across Canada who have provided us with the opportunity to be here in this vast and beautiful country. We are thankful for your investments over generations in maintaining this land and working to preserve its natural sanctity. Specifically, though, as an organization dedicated to gender equity and the just treatment of women, Qtrick also wants to acknowledge all of the women and men across Canada who have invested years of efforts into tracing, defending, and speaking up for lost and murdered Indigenous women across this nation who are disappearing in disproportionate numbers because they are targeted by violent sexism and racism combined. Qtrick believes mobility is a social liberator. Transit is a force of liberation. It gets people to where they need to go to generate wealth, to generate happiness, and to live their lives as they see fit. We know safe and secure mobility and transit services are critical to the safety of Indigenous women, Black women, and women nationwide, and we're aware that we have an obligation and duty to act in this regard. Thank you, Yosipa. Bonjour à tous. Mon nom est Carla Guillaume et je suis coordonnatrice et agent de liaison pour le Critique au Québec. Je vous souhaite à tous la bienvenue de manière virtuelle à notre deuxième conférence annuelle sur les technologies de mobilité intelligente à faible émission de carbone. Avant de commencer, je tiens d'abord à exprimer mes remerciements et ma gratitude à toutes les communautés autochtones du Canada qui sont les gardiens des terres sur lesquelles je me trouve aujourd'hui. Merci. J'aimerais maintenant débuter cette conférence avec un mot très important, le mot « essentiel ». Au cours des derniers mois, le mot essentiel a été utilisé pour définir, entre autres, les services et les activités nécessaires pour maintenir la sécurité et le bien-être du public. En pleine pandémie, nous nous sommes entendus pour affirmer que le transport en commun est effectivement un service essentiel indispensable pour déplacer nos travailleurs de la santé et tous ces gens qui nous permettent de vivre un semblant de normalité même en temps de chaos. Toutefois, tout au long de cette conférence, J'aimerais que nous gardions en tête que l'action de déplacer les citoyens et les citoyennes d'un point A au point B est bien plus qu'une activité essentielle. La mobilité est au centre de notre train de vie moderne et c'est pour cette raison que nous devons mettre la technologie à la disposition de tous, incluant les populations vulnérables, dont les femmes, les groupes racisés et les personnes à mobilité réduite, pour assurer un meilleur accès aux emplois, à l'éducation, aux loisirs, à la culture et aux services que l'on dit essentiels. La mobilité durable doit absolument être l'affaire de tous. Au moment où l'on se parle, la réalité est que l'offre en transport n'est pas toujours bien adaptée aux besoins des groupes qui en ont le plus besoin. Ces groupes vulnérables occupent souvent des emplois situés hors des périmètres de transport urbain et doivent faire face à des horaires décalés et peu flexibles. On parle aussi très peu de ceux qui ne peuvent pas se permettre de se déplacer en raison de leurs revenus plus faibles. Durant les trois prochains jours, nous aurons de longues discussions sur la technologie, la recherche, les modèles d'affaires, l'innovation et le financement du transport de demain. Bien que beaucoup de ces conversations seront très techniques, je vous invite à toujours penser à l'aspect humain de la chose. Gardons en tête que le transport en commun est d'abord et avant tout un outil de cohésion sociale qui permet de réduire les disparités socio-économiques entre les groupes, les régions, mais aussi les générations. En cette période de forte tension sociale partout à travers le monde, réfléchissons ensemble aux façons dont nous pouvons utiliser la mobilité pour combattre le racisme, l'exclusion et la violence. Thank you, Carla, and merci. As Carla said, mobility and transit are essential to the liberation of people. But the question is always, which people? And whose liberation? Whose lives? We are in a period of significant social movement social movements that have forced us by the power of people to recognize whose lives matter. These movements are pointing to problems that need to be fixed. And at Qtrick, we believe we're part of the solution. We believe transit and shared mobility offer solutions to some of the most critical social, political, and colonial ills of our day. 
And we believe in creating those solutions, even when they run against the norms of how things have been done in the past, when it upsets the powers that be and the established status quo. Because we know the past has been full of sexism, racism, colonial patriarchy, and demeaning power mongering. The future does not need to look like the past, but it's not going to come easily either. For example, we're here to talk about electrification, the conversion of Canada from a petroleum state to a green economy based on green electrons from hydro and windmills stored in batteries and hydrogen and fueling our entire transportation system. When the Globe and Mail and the CBC and the National Post reported just two months ago that the price of oil dropped into negative terrain, some of us were thinking, is this the oracle we've all been waiting for? A vision for a diversified economy, not reliant on the extraction of black gold for the production of polluting wealth that predefines the politics and the paychecks of so many Canadians. And while we're wondering that, others were lobbying Ottawa to save the oil industry, to ignore global price signals in the interest of the oil patch. And in this process of transition, as we reform how things have been and how they must change in the future, we will find we are struggling against privileged positions of power and wealth. Recent social movements that color our days and our news may be forcing us to understand our own privilege today. And we may feel threatened by the concept of undoing privilege that we've gotten used to. If we are threatened, and our natural resistance occurs, then know that we are not alone. It is difficult for people to understand that if we're in a position of power or have high income earning status or political control, that we may not be there because of or primarily because of our talent or our skill, but because a door was easily opened for us, a network was ready to welcome us by people that look and sound and talk like us. And it's equally hard to imagine that in this transformative period, other doors or those same doors were shut for women and men that don't look, don't sound like us. And that for black women and men, there wasn't even a door. There was just a cement wall. Our inability to see these obstacles is our privilege. But however, we choose to change the world going forward Let's keep in mind the words of the 19th century suffragette and poet Mary Lathrop, to walk a mile in the moccasins of our neighbor. If we choose to do that, to walk a mile in the moccasins of our neighbor or our professional colleague these days, and try to stand on the outside looking in behind a closed door that won't open or a cement wall constructed to keep us out with no one around to help us scale the wall or shove the door open, then what we will see is a lot of people in positions of power making a lot of money by keeping us on the outside based on their own fear of true competition for talent. And then we will feel too and experience the frustration and the anger of exclusion. Exclusion from privilege, exclusion from power advancement, and exclusion from equality. Actions and solutions that change these situations, that equalize the playing ground and open up all positions, all power, all decision making to qualified and talented people, regardless of gender and race, they require co-action. They can't be generated by us if we live in a bubble of privilege because we aren't informed enough on our own. These solutions can only be generated if we engage both sides of the equation by working to recognize the problems and trialing solutions while enculturing a sense of safety and psychological security among everyone that a radically different future, one that has a mosaic of decision makers at the top of the levels of power, is not something we need to be afraid of or threatened by, but something that we can and should be proud of achieving. In this era of social movements, there is a great deal of common ground to be found if we can work together in whatever way we can to change and fix the situation. You wouldn't be at this conference if you didn't believe in solutions. You wouldn't be listening to this speech if you didn't believe in solutions. You wouldn't know Qtrick if you didn't believe in solutions. Qtrick members are all about solutions, finding ways to resolve problems that humanity needs resolved. And we know living in the moment that we do today, there is common ground to be found and bridges to be built between I do not consent, I cannot breathe, and I have a family too. Let's think about the problems that contemporary social movements have revealed to us, which Qtrick is acknowledging and working to address head on. The Me Too movement is something many of you know as a women's rights movement, something associated specifically with the allegations and eventually the charges and conviction against Harvey Weinstein's sexual abuse in the Hollywood community. It spread through business and justice and political circles as women came forward with stories about suppressed sexual harassment at the workplace and in the home.
Sexual abuse by men in positions of power that lorded over them and stymied their career advancement. But the Me Too movement actually started long before the Alyssa Milano hashtag of hashtag Me Too. It started more than 15 years ago in 2006 by Tarana Burke, a woman of color, an American activist from the Bronx in New York who started the Me Too movement on a MySpace page to fight for women's advancement in the face of sexual violence of women of color. The movement has grown to include all women, all colors, all forms of sexual violence from light touching to full on rape and murder. The movement has also come to include an ethos around ensuring that women and transgendered people, many of whom are graduating in droves from universities and colleges around the world, are not excluded from obtaining the positions of power in the industries we are experts in, in finance, in manufacturing, and yes, in transit and transportation, by virtue of men and other women who use sexual violence to degrade or exclude us. And this movement has a long, venerable history too, the global Me Too movement has followed in the tradition of Rosa Parks, who is today recognized as a civil rights activist in the fight for black equality, but who also dedicated her career to defending the rights of women to ensure women voted and gain political power so they could determine their own pathways. And as we all know, in 1955, Rosa Parks made one of her most famous stands on a bus, her primary mode of mobility that fed into her career as a seamstress and fed into her ability to be a successful professional and the head of a successful family. She refused to go to the back of the bus as a person living in black skin and a woman's body. Don't think it went unpunished either because Ms. Parks was fired for her job for insisting that mobility and transit be equally accessible to black people and women. It's 2020, not 1955. Yet study after study after study has shown that you and I know someone and that someone may be ourselves who has been raped or sexually assaulted or sexually harassed at the workplace or in the home by someone they know. And if we think the transit and transportation industries are immune from the vile diseases of sexualized patriarchy, we need to once more ask ourselves, whose lives do we actually care about? Whose lives are we actually aware of? And to what extent are we ignorant? According to women's groups, right, uh, women's groups in America, a rape happens every two minutes. A among Aboriginal women, it's 30% who have reported being sexually assaulted or harassed. Among African American women, 20% report having been sexually assaulted. And that's not only poor women, this is women in the middle class, women working to get to executive power, and that's only the worst kind of sexual assault. According to Statistics Canada, over 80% of sexual assault and harassment goes unreported entirely. And that doesn't even include the microaggressions that keep women out by exhausting us. As Rosa Parks herself said, she was tired of giving in. And yet sometimes as women and visible minorities, we do give up because we are tired. We're tired of constantly having to fight for our equality and for respect. At QTRIP, we know that violence and harassment, which keeps women and people of color out of positions of power, starts with an imbalance in access to power positions. This starts with an imbalance in the hiring process, an inequality in terms of who gets an open door, who has it slammed in their face. This is critical in transit and shared mobility, because we know the majority of transit riders in Canada, according to Statistics Canada, are women. But the majority of CEOs and decision makers, including ministers of transportation, are not. And forget the majority, based on our early research at QTRIC, less than 10% of top transit decision makers in this country are women. It's horrible. That's the only word. It is horrible. A fundamental disconnect exists between the leaders and power holders of transit and transportation who are making healthy paychecks off running the system and designing it, and the clientele who knows what we need to make the system better for our lives. At QTRIC, we're doing what we can as a consortium of members across the country. Since 2016, QTRIC has had a gender parity policy that insists at least 50% of our board of directors are women, and it's worked amazingly well. We've grown exponentially every year, and our projects keep getting bigger and better. From nothing five years ago, we now have a nonprofit operational budget of over $2 million, and we manage projects of more than $50 million. In 2020, we funded the federal, with the federal funding program, MyTax, a new postdoctoral research fellow. She's starting to build the first sunshine list of gender data in transit. Starting with CEOs and directors, we're going to be comparing and contrasting how much women CEOs and directors make, when they were hired, how much experience was required of them at the time of hiring, and then compare that data to their male counterparts. And of course, we won't stop there. There is more common ground to be had 
between the clarion calls of I do not consent and I cannot breathe. Racialization exists everywhere. And at QTRIC, we know that, which is why we're going to be expanding our sunshine list to look at racial factors into the future. We know that is a former and still colonial state, one that has as the head of our government a queen whose family and wealth, whose entire rural empire expanded over three centuries based on colonial plunder. As Canadians, we know that there are colonial forms of racial exclusion at play in this country. We are willfully ignorant if we believe it does not affect our industry in transit and transportation. We already know in Canada, we have a fundamental lack of racial diversity in our transit and transportation decision making. I know I live in the skin of a woman from an immigrant family that does not speak English at home. And I'm aware of everything that that entails, both within the culture I was raised and outside of it. But I do not live in the skin of a black woman or a brown woman or of an indigenous woman. I do not live in the skin of a racialized person, which is why I've built a team around me that does to make sure that I have those brains and that knowledge on my team and not external to it. Since QTRIC was created, we have sought diversity in our thinking, our approach to problems and our solution building. As of today, more than 50% of our team is not white and 50% of our team is women, including managers and technical decision makers. Of the people on our team who might identify as white, including myself, 50% did not grow up speaking English at home. We have and have had on our team Christians, Catholics, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, agnostics, and in myself, an atheist. I like to believe that QTRIG is a natural representation of the fabric of Canada, but it's not. This type of diversity and multicultural mosaic in cognitive, cultural, professional skills and experiences, it doesn't just happen in business. It doesn't just happen in transportation. It doesn't just happen in transit. It doesn't happen organically. As a leader and as a CEO, we need to make it happen. It's a choice. It won't happen organically because the system of exclusion stopping people from rising to the top is not organic in and of itself. It is artificial and constructed on the framework of closed off circles that do not want to open up or share their wealth. The solution must focus proactively on dismantling an artificial framework of access. As an industry, transit and transportation needs to make a choice not just to welcome diversity, but to actively pursue it, to measure it, to live by it, to set targets and achieve it. Unless we think that diversity is a philosophical nice to have, but not a necessary to have, let us remind ourselves of one of the worst situations our industry today has faced and over the past two decades. In Canada, we have the highway of tears. It is a literal highway a set of isolated roads upon which for decades, girls and women have gone and disappeared. They've been missing or murdered. And this stretch of highway runs across Northwestern British Columbia. It has come to symbolize a national crisis linked to the death and killing and murder of what we now estimate to be 4,000 indigenous women across the country who have been killed trying to get from point A to point B. This is our industry. This is transit and transportation. Why were these women, why are they still having to hitchhike on a highway full of murderous predators? This is our problem and our industry must fix it. If we think this is not our problem to fix, then let's ask ourselves, whose problem is it? Whose problem is it to provide people with safe and secure transit and mobility so they can get to where they need to get to safely and securely? Because if it's not our problem, whose is it? Racialized women have found common ground between I do not consent and I cannot breathe. In the COVID-19 pandemic, we also learned that more women are going out of work compared to men. In a she session that will take years to undo, more women are exposed to pandemic than men because of the nature of their work as essential workers like nurses and part-time food and industry frontline workers and their use of public transit to get to work. We also know that racial minorities are more exposed to pandemic than the rest of us, Again, in part because of the nature of work and a greater proportion of transit usage. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, George Floyd was suffocated to death by power, by privilege, and by racist hate. We also know that based on the latest job figures in North America, the unemployment rate is falling faster for whites than blacks because of the kinds of jobs we do. George Floyd was out trying to earn an income to live his life. In doing so, he also contracted coronavirus. There is common ground to be had between I do not consent, I cannot breathe, and I have a family too. 
the slogan that many of us saw nurses hold up on medical placards in silent pandemic video footage. In all of these instances, we are all in the pursuit of human dignity, human equality, and power balance. That represents all of our needs, not just some of our needs. Transit and transportation is at the front line in these social movements. It cannot be reactionary as an industry that's dragged along by obligation. We are an innovation consortium at Qtric, and we believe that transit and transportation must be proactive as a force for social change and social mobility. Social innovation as part of technological innovation. And sometimes we will make enemies in doing so. Trust me, I already have them, people in positions of power who work against what we do, sometimes quietly behind closed doors and sometimes openly and explicitly. And that's gonna be expected, haters gonna hate after all. But because status quo creates benefits, we will continually face opposition to trying to undo it. There's a necessary opposition that comes with trying to dismantle any status quo. Undoing those benefits will result in anger, and that's okay, because we're going to gain a lot more collaborative friendships and respectful networks along the way that help us advance solutions rather than promulgate antiquated problems. And in this pursuit of a gender and racially aware transit and shared mobility industry, we must all recall the common ground to be found with another social movement of our day. One that affects everything we do, everywhere we do it, all the time. The great climate crisis. A crisis that continues to drive up emissions, cause irreparable weather pattern changes, toxify our city air, and damage our physical infrastructure. Over the past two years, a teenager named Greta Thunberg inspired millions of people, young and old, to leave their schools and homes and protest in unison to demand climate action at the top levels of power. She gave us rallying cries like Climate Strike and Fridays for Future. And of course, we deserve a safe future. Children marched and held up placards reading, give me a future. But before we think all is well and good on our happy way to a healthier future, know that parents today are told to talk to their kids about anxiety and depression caused by believing they don't have a future. Teenagers are recording videos and posting them on YouTube saying there's no point in living because they're gonna die young from climate disaster. Climate disaster that my generation continues to create. Parents don't know what to do. It is our industry's job to show them a way, to help them out, to show them we can build better mobility that liberates women, liberates racialized communities, and liberates children by giving them a free and fair future. It helps to set us all free. Cleaner and faster mobility moves more people more quickly, more conveniently, with no carbon, and starts to set us free. And in that, we will find common ground on the basis of one simple principle that all of us in the low carbon smart mobility community live by, human dignity for all. I do not consent. I cannot breathe. I have, no fam I have a family too, and we deserve a safe future. These statements point to a lack of humanity. Overcoming them points to our collective humanity. Over the next three days, we're going to give you a lot of ideas as to how you can act to develop humanity, a sense of it, a belief in it, a motivation to build it. And throughout this week, we will hear from transit agencies overcoming pandemic exclusion by making rides healthier and more convenient. Transit agencies working to make safety a number one consideration through data and artificial intelligence and optimization. And companies and governments and transit operators looking to eliminate pollution for once and for all from the transportation industry to turn it into the kind of economy and transportation network we can all be proud of and want to work for. Technology cannot solve all problems, but it can solve a lot of them. And we in this community, we are where it starts. We're talking about electrification, autonomy, connectivity to create cleaner, more connected, freer and fairer societies. And in that spirit, I would like to launch this great event with a great launch. As many of you know, Qtric has long developed deep knowledge about the low carbon smart mobility economy in Canada and globally, but we've generally held that knowledge in house. Now we want to shout it out from the rooftops and share everything we know from the highs and the lows, the must haves around innovating transit in industry and innovating the transportation systems for the 21st century. Last month, we formally launched our Qtric Kritsuk Low Carbon Smart Mobility Knowledge Series, a series of research publications and white papers that we've prepared with federal, provincial, and industry partners over the past two years. We kicked it off with our National Rail Innovation Report, which documents the top 10 rail innovation projects at play in this country. And today, I am proud to announce that we are launching our second publication in the series, 
funded by Natural Resources Canada and entitled Best Practices and Key Considerations for Transit Electrification. This report is live and available on our website right now for all attendees at this conference and beyond. The report shares all the best knowledge in battery and electric bus experiences, lessons learned, investment decisions and planning decisions ahead for full fleet electrification and zero emissions transit in Canada. And as we forge ahead this week in opening up the learnings, our learnings to a wider world, we urge you to also follow along and share this conversation online using the hashtag Qtric Conference to help us ensure that lessons learned and the knowledge shared over the next three days extend beyond the closed off circle of 400 people here today and that they can be shared with a world of billions beyond our physical, psychological and philosophical boundaries. Welcome, bienvenue, and I wish you a wonderful conference ahead.